has. Does anyone have anything they'd like to bring up in the meeting today? Any burning questions? Okay, well, I, I'll go to this question that came in then. Um, it was so, someone referring to, you know, lately I have people like quoting things that I said in recorded classes and then I'm like, wow, I have to really be careful what I'm saying. <laughs> like they're transcribing the things I said and then coming back and like, what exactly did you mean by this? What exactly do you like? Oh man, I have to be really careful, you know what I'm saying? Um, so I had someone bring up something that I said in one class um, regarding this Dharma, Arta, Kama, and Moksha. Um, I think most of you are familiar with these terms. It's always helpful to review. Um, and I was referring to this, this is the in the second verse of Srimad Bhagavatam, right? Veda Vyas. He he's this is like the beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam, and he's specifically announcing that we are rejecting all types of cheating religion, Kaitava Dharma, which is referring to any religion that is mixed with these these ideal lower ideals of Dharma Arta Kama Moksha. Um, what is Dharma, Arta, Kama, Moksha, for those who don't know? Um, Dharma is referring to ritualistic religion or ordinary piety. You know. um, Arta is referring to wealth, Kama, to sense pleasure. And, um, and then Moksha is liberation, right? And so, you know, general religion is, it. you know, there's an element of, you know, worship of God or some higher being, but then it's mixed with these lower ideals. Oh, great. Chinmoy Prabhu shared the link here. So Julian, take a note of that. Um, in our chat here, you'll see Prabhu shared a link to that class. Awesome. Um, and, and so, so well, where to start? But we'll, this so this person who said in this question they they thought that when we say we're rejecting cheating religion we're referring to general religions like christianity or islam and so on and that's not necessarily what i'm saying actually actually veda vyas is referring to the general vedic religion you know he's you know there's also a there's a there's a pure form of christianity Right. Actually, Christianity in its pure form is is practically Vaishnavism. It's just without the without the um the details that you find. It's it's the same, really. Shilashidamaj describes it as as hazy Vaishnavism, you know, vague Vaishnavism. Krishna consciousness is just zooming in. So, you know, we could say there's a pure and also an impure form of of any religion. Um you know, at its at its as I said, like Christianity at its highest point is practically Vaishnavism, right? So well, actually, Veda Vyas is referring to the general Vedic religion, what's been presented previously in the in the you know in the previous Vedic literatures. And so, you know, so for example, you know, I mean like we you could say like all the Vedic scriptures are kind of divided into these three categories when it comes to ideals of religion. There's um there's um you know karma kanda, right? Karma kanda section is referring to a section of the Vedas which is encouraging persons who are very attached to mundane, you know, attainments like wealth, like pleasure. Um Marie has a comment here. In its pure form, Christianity is Vaishnav with so few details, you don't have any choice but to have faith. Uh-huh. <laughs> nice. Because there aren't thousands of details, thousands of years of detailed cosmological information. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um so the karma kanda section, it's aimed at persons who who are, are attracted to mundane attainments like wealth you know like sense pleasure and so there's a there are you know there are different 
types of religious practices, different types of worship to different deities that are encouraged, but which have some mundane ends, right? And the idea is that persons are being encouraged to live a life of not just, you know, wanton selfishness, you know, random whimsical selfishness, but to live like there's room for enjoyment, but at least it's controlled, it's being regulated. And there is the connection of a higher deity. So there's some faith in a higher being, right? So it's like a starting point, right? Then there's, um, you know, then there's the jnana marga, right? And that's referring to the, that section, which is aimed at those seeking for liberation, right? There, you know, moksha. And normally the aspiration for moksha, it, you know, it has, um, it has a it, it's a very it has a very respectable position right if someone if someone is a you know in the line of renunciation renouncing mundane enjoyment then generally that's that's something very honored right and and there's something appreciable there but actually it's just on it's just the other side of the coin of the of the karma kanda right of the pursuit of material pleasure why because it's 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 first of all, it's self-centered. It still has the I, us in the middle. And second of all, it's just a reaction to, it's a reactive mode of being, right? Renunciation is just a reaction to the, the limitations of, um, to the consequences of exploitation, right? That's all it is, right? You know, one, one realizes that you know, living a life of selfish enjoyment comes along with consequences. And then, so then let's just give it all up, right? And even if it's not based on a reaction to exploitation, even if it is just based on a pure, like, appreciation of Brahma Gyan, right? Like awareness of our spiritual nature, awareness of, the, of, of a higher spiritual being, right? It's still not living with, you know, it's still not living in a God-centered reality. And it's also not sustainable because it's dry. It doesn't reflect a life of renunciation or just absorption in impersonal spirit and Brahman, you know, that doesn't reflect the true nature of the soul, right? It is natural for the soul to be active. It is natural for the soul to love. It is natural for the soul to feel. Right, all these things are very natural for the soul. So, so, so these all these other pursuits, they, you know, they're, they're, they're not sustainable, you know, because they're not, they don't reflect our true self, and they're not actually realizing what our, what our real place within the organic whole is. Right, it's only when we enter the God-centered world, the Krishna-centered universe that we are finding our actual place within the whole, right? Otherwise, these other ways of being, they're, 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 it's like an isolated, it's a disconnected way to live. It's not actually living in harmony with our environment. So, <clears throat> and then, you know, you know, so, you know, Dharma are, are Dharma, and Dharma can be a little puzzling because because Dharma also has different connotations, right? And you know, Dharma, you know, there's, you know, but in, you know, Dharma can also, Dharma is also something that we're trying to follow, right? But you know, but there are different expressions of Dharma. Right. And in this context of Dharma Arta Kama Moksha, it's this like, you know, ordinary, um, you know, maybe Dharma can mean duty, right? So it can be some, you know, can refer to a mundane, dutiful existence. Like, like you could say general sattvic living, right? Mode of goodness living. But if it, but that, that can, that can, you know, there's there's actually these interesting verses in the beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam, and there's a place where Srila Sridhar is is um discussing them. See, because what's very funny is like, let like for an example, as an example, right? 
like wealth should be used in pursuit of dharma, right? Arta, right? Wealth or you know, or material resources, they should be used in the in the furtherance of dharma, right? Religion. But what but what often happens, what tends to happen, it gets flipped around the other way, right? So that dharma gets used. Religion gets used as a tool to increase our arta. So this is the type of um, dharma that's being rejected, right? You know, re religion or duty that has some, you know, mundane result as an attainment. Or we could also say general conception of the mode of goodness that's not in connection with Krishna's interest, which is not in connection with the nirguna plane, the eternal transcendental flow. So this is the type of dharma which is being rejected. But dharma, you know, duty or religion that is supporting, you know, our God-centered, Krishna-centered life, you know, that, that of course, that is, a, that is um, to be embraced, right? In fact, everything is to be embraced if it's in connection with Krishna, right? Wealth, you know, beauty, everything. Right? Moksha, moksha will come to serve the devotee, actually. <laughs> that is also my, all these things. In fact, there's a really beautiful, would you mind passing me a copy of Prakhtanaji and Amrita? There's a really beautiful verse of um, Bilva Mangal Thakur, where he's talking about how We've moved everything around. Yeah. Uh, there it is. Um, where he's speaking about, you know, he's saying, if my devotion was more advanced, then all of these things, Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha, they would come to serve. They would come to serve me, right? They want to serve me in, in service to you, right? So there's this beautiful verse by Bilva Mangal Thakur, who, by the way, had a very interesting journey, Bilva Mangal Thakur. You know, he he's, you know, most of you probably remember that story. He's the one who was, um, he had that uh, that um, obsession with the prostitute, Chintamani. And, and then she actually inspired him, you know, to give up, you know, his life of meaningless enjoyment, mundane enjoyment. And, but, but first he had, he had a, he had a stint as a as a Mayavadi, actually. He had a Mayavadi guru. Um, I forget his name. But he went, there was one phase when he he was absorbed like in this in this monistic, on this monistic path, of, you know, focused on the Advaita conception of oneness, um, and approaching impersonal Brahman. And then after that, then from there he and went on to become a great Krishna Bhakta, a great devotee of Krishna. But there's one beautiful verse. Let me see if I can find it. Bhakti Stray Stira Tara 319. Here it is. <clears throat> so this is um verse of Bilva Mangotaka, which Shilas Chinamarsh has included in Prabhupada Jivanamrita. Bhakti Swai Stira Tara Bhagavan Yadi Syat Daivena Nafalati Divya Kishora Murti Bhukti Swayamukali Tanjali Seva Tisman Dharmarta Kamagataya Samaya Patiksha. O Supreme Lord, if our devotion for you were more steadfast, your adolescent form would naturally arise within our hearts. Then there would not be the slightest necessity to pray for the triple pursuits of religiosity, gain and material gain, referring to arta, sensual desire, and their negation in the form of liberation, mukti. Because mukti will personally attend to us. Yeah, there are a lot of parentheses here, which make it a little more complicated. But um, as a concomitant subsidiary fruit of devotion, right? In other words, mukti will come as like a side effect. Liberation will come as a side effect of bhakti, devotion. Her hands cupped in prayer, like a preordained maidservant. And the fruits of bhukti, bhukti is referring to mundane 
um, mundane pleasure, mundane fruits. Transitory pleasure culminating in attainment of heaven will eagerly await their orders from us should any necessity is arise for them in the service of your lotus feet. So, so uh, we'll, we'll kind of break this down a bit. Mukti Swayam Mukli Tanjali Seva Tezma. So it's saying Mukti Devi herself, the goddess of liberation will come with folded hands, Anjali, like her hands cupped in prayer, waiting for service, Seva te, waiting for Seva. And Dharma, Dharma Arta Kama Gataya Samaya Pratiksha. And then Dharma Arta and Kama, you know, they will wait, right? At a respectful distance. You know, waiting for some orders, right? Shilashita Maharaj, in one place, he's talking about this verse and he says, like, you know, like, like in like old fashioned, like rich households, they'll have like calling bells. He was saying, like, they'll wait for the bell for when the Krishna Bhakta needs something for their service to Krishna. They'll wait, they're waiting for that call. <laughs> <clears throat> One of our Guru Dave's um, personal servants, um, Bengali devotee, he he told me that once um, once our Guru Dave told him like, "Have you ever seen me ask anyone for money?" And, and his servant said, "No, Guru Dave, I haven't." And Guru Dave said, "He said Lakshmi Devi likes to serve the devotees of Krishna." <laughs> so whenever there's some necessity, you know, she will come. No, I don't have to go and ask. You know, she, she will come for Krishna's service. <laughs> so, and then, you know, we can also add, like, this is also a test that will come, you know, at, at, a, at a certain point in the path of the practitioner, right? Where these things will come, because naturally, like, because bhakti is so beautiful, Bhakti Devi, the goddess of devotion, she's the most beautiful and the most attractive. And, and so when bhakti is starting to emerge in the heart of a practitioner, then it will attract all these things, right? It will attract fame, right? It will attract wealth, followers, power, resources. And then this can be like a point of test, right? Where that practitioner can... can and it's mentioned in one outline it's that's given by one of our acharyas it's a very nice expression ta, uh, ta, taranga i can't remember the, the the bengali but it means dabbling in the in the byproducts of devotion <laughs> <laughs> like that can be like a distraction on the path dabbling in the byproducts of devotion and when so when that happens in the life of a practitioner when they start to see oh these things are coming to me. Of course, it may not be. Everyone's journey is different, but it is it, it, it is often the case that that may happen. Then that's the point where the practitioner has to be a little alert. Like, oh no, I must keep all these things for the service of Krishna. Right? I'm not going to become involved with those things, you know, as an end in themselves. But keep all these things, you know, in check and use them only if, they're required in the service of Krishna. It's uh, uh let me see if I can find that um that outline. We published it on um godiyadarshan.com. It's quite quite interesting and helpful. Let me see here. Things. Um, I think it's your fundamentals. Very interesting. And welcome, uh, Tunga Rasa just joined us. Where is it? Here, um, no, that's not it. The steps on the path of here it is. So this is from Vishwan Bhakti uh, Vishwana Chakrati Thakur, one of our uh, charges. Yeah, so he's mentioning like these different symptoms of unsteadiness that the practitioner will, will face. 
The first is the first one you'll hear mentioned um, more often. Our Gurudev has mentioned it a couple of times. Utsahamayi literally means full of enthusiasm, but it's referring to this kind of like unsteady false enthusiasm, which is based on more of an emotion and it doesn't last very long. And um, and the next one mentioned Gana Tarala, which is referring to wavering endeavor. You know, sometimes coming on strong, sometimes weak. Then the next is Vyudavikalpa, indecision. Then the next mention, struggle with the mundane. The next is inability to follow guidelines. And then this is the one that I was mentioning, Tarangarangini, attachment to the byproducts of devotional practice, <laughs> wealth, enjoyment, adoration, and so on. And the literal meaning of this is dabbling in the waves of the ocean of bhakti. <laughs> oh, here, the, here's another nice list here. Five obstacles in devotional practice. Number one, lie, lethargy, becoming drowsy while engaged in hearing, chanting, remembering, and other devotional practices. <laughs> oh, that rings a bell. <laughs> Becoming drowsy while we made. So falling asleep in the morning class. <laughs> Becoming drowsy while engaged in hearing, chanting, remembering other devotional practices. <clears throat> and the next one mentioned is Vikshepa. Distraction. Discussing or remembering ordinary matters while engaged in devotional practices. <laughs> that tends to happen a lot when we're chanting Japa, right? <laughs> Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare. Oh, hey, nice to see you. <laughs> Apratipati, indifference, feeling that one is unable to engage in devotional practice. Kashai, sin, being captivated by anger, greed, pride, and so on while engaged in devotional practice. Rasasvada, Taste for the mundane, not being consciously immersed while engaged in devotional practice because of one's attachment to material enjoyment. <laughs> okay, well, um, I think that's all I have to say on that topic. Chin Moipru, do you want to add anything on that subject matter? Well, very nicely, please. <laughs> Or anyone else in our group today want to add any thoughts or has another question? Julian, do you have any anything you'd like to hear more about? Uh yeah, I had a I had a question. Um, it was, um, um, pretty much, uh, I just wanted to know what, what exactly Srila Srila Maharaj, uh, mission was with, with the Ma. Uh, I was wondering if, if like, you know, if he was, uh, trying to expand it more or, or you know, what, what was his ultimate mission with, with starting the mod? <laughs> well, that's a very nice question. That's a great question. Um, and there's, I mean, there's a lot of background, you know, that, that is required to be able to answer that too. Um, uh -huh. So, I mean, actually, Shula Shudamarsh, he, he, he was not in the mood to go and start a big rescue mission, you know, and, he was, I mean, his, in general, his inclination was more towards like his inner, his inner, you know, life of devotion, right? And he, he was an amazing, um, uh, San, you know, Sanskritian. And he, he wrote, you know, very, very fine Sanskrit poetry. You know, his inclination was more, you know, to, to, you know, for like tasting and expressing like the the inner depths of what Krishna consciousness is, and 
And as he mentioned, like like in a small circle, that was more his nature, you know, to like a, like a like a smaller, more exclusive kind of circle, going more to the the deeper side of things, and in a, that was more his inclination. He was a very great preacher, um, in the mission of his guru Maharaj, his guru Maharaj, right? Shri Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. He he preached quite extensively all over India. He traveled all over India, and he he was very brilliant in presentation, also in debate. You know, we heard many stories from our Guru Dev of different incidents when when um you know he would he would have some, you know, scriptural debate, some philosophical debate with different scholars, and he would always, you know, be, you know, the victor in those. And and he he was quite well known for that. And, and there were some cases where his godbrothers would call for him, like if they were struggling um, in trying to establish their mission in some place, they were, they were being you know, given a hard time by local scholars and whatnot, then they would call for him. I know the two cases that we heard from our Guru Dev like that. Um, so he was known for that, and and his Guru Maharaj also recognized his um his his brilliance and his understanding of the scripture. And so you know he was you know he was um preaching quite extensively in the mission of his Guru Maharaj. But then when his guru left the world, that was um, beginning of 1937, then the mission started to break apart. And it's, you know, often the case when a great soul leaves the world, then, um, you know, without that central harmonizing um, personality, then, then it can be hard to maintain the, you know, the unity in the mission. And and um, and actually, many of Shri Sridhar's godbrothers they wanted to make him the head of a new mission, but he he was again his nature was never you know to to take the front lead, you know he he called to he referred to himself as a back pushing man, you know he liked to stay at the back, and so he nominated one of his godbrothers to take a leading position. That unfortunately didn't work out, and that person ended up deviating in in quite an unfortunate way, and so that led to further, you know, breakdown of his guru's mission. And and, and at a certain point, Shri Shudamarsh just withdrew very quietly, and he decided he just wanted to go on with his devotional life in a solitary way, and so he went. To Vrindavan, he spent the month of Kartik there. This would have been like, like Kartik time, like October 1941, around that time. And he spent the month of Kartik there, kind of in this mood of prayer and of trying to understand the way forward. And he was considering, oh, where should I stay? And he thought about staying in Vrindavan. He thought, of, thought about staying in Jagannath Puri. And finally, he decided he wanted to stay in Navadvip because Navadvip is the place of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, right? And he is known as the the uh, the avatar of great mercy, right? Mahavadan Yai avatar. And, you know, Navadvip, he considered very humbly, oh, Navadvip is the place for the fallen soul. So I will go and stay in Navadvip. And... He, and so he so that was his idea that he will very quietly stay there and continue with his own bhajan, his own devotional service in a very humble and quiet way. But what happened is he went to Eka Chakra, you know, to take Eka Chakra is the birthplace of Nityananda Prabhu. Do you know who is Nityananda right by now? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. So Nityananda is is um is um you know. Mahaprabhu's like principal um you know associate and he's also Balade, Balaram, and Krishna Leela. And um so he because Lord Nityananda he's considered to be the master of the Dham of the of the holy the Lord's holy abode. 
So he went to take permission from Nityananda Prabhu, permission, blessings to stay in Navadri. And when he went there, and there's there's a deity, and the, actually the deity's been moved now. He's not there anymore. But um, in the birthplace, in this birthplace of Nityananda Prabhu, there's this famous deity, beautiful deity. And he prayed to that deity, um, you know, asking for blessings. And, and he heard a response from that, from Nityananda Prabhu, kind of giving him a little bit of a chastisement. And saying, oh, you're asking for mercy, but you already have so much mercy, you know, you from your Guru Maharaj, and you're keeping that to yourself, you know, and you're, and you're asking for more. He said, you, you have to give, you have to share what mercy you have. And, and so, Shila Sridhar Maharaj, oh, Chintamani is joined us, great. <laughs> she's been traveling all, she's been jet setting Transcendental jet setter. <laughs> Great to have you with us in time. And um, so, so he received this instruction from Nityananda Prabhu. And so, and so Shila Srinamarsh, he had to, you know, reconceive, you know, what he was going to be doing going forward. And so he decided, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to go out you know, actively canvassing, you know, trying to bring people. But if people come to me for shelter, I'll give them shelter. That was his decision. And because really it was not his inclination to be a great guru. And in fact, you know, he refused many people who came to him for initiation. You know, Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada's sister, you know, Srila Prabhupada, the founder of ISKCON, his sister wanted to take initiation from Srila Sridhamarsh, but he, he, you know, refused her. And he sent her to um, one of his godbrothers, Bhakti Saranga Goswami Maharaj. So, you know, he really was not inclined to become a great guru. And, but receiving this order from Nityananda, he said, okay, if people come to me for shelter, then I will give them shelter. And, and so then he went to Nabadweep and he, he started, you know, this mission in a very small way, you know, and we have a photograph. You, I think you've seen that photograph of the, it was like a very small little thatched hut on the banks of the Ganges. Yeah. You've seen that. But what is, but what is interesting, right? And our Guru Dave also made this, I heard him make, at this point once it's like Srila Sridhamarsh also wrote this shloka this verse right which is describing the glory of the ma so he also knew right because this verse it's it's a it's making a very big claim you know the, the verse is describing the ma you know as the matavat as the best of all mats and it's describing this grand, you know, Jaya Shri victory flag that's shining high, announcing the glories of this Mat. So it's kind of interesting, you know, that, you know, he also could see the, I mean, obviously, like the, the substantial side is very glorious, but he's also indicating that he could see that this mission was going to expand and become something bigger, right? Although that wasn't so much his inclination, you know, he could see that this was something that was going to take place. And, and then our Guru Dave was the one who made that a reality. You know, our Guru Dave, he, he manifested that vision of Srila Sridhamarj. But we see, you know, consistently in the life of Srila Sridhamarj, he was always kind of withdrawing um, from too many crowds, too many followers. And our Guru Dave, you know, consistently was always kind of like pressing him a little bit, pushing him a little bit, putting some pressure. And why? Because our Guru Dave wanted him, our Guru Dave wanted other souls to also receive the mercy of his Guru Maharaj, right? So our Guru Dave was was always kind of like pushing the limits of Srila Sridhar Maharaj, you know, and you know, our Guru Dave was, you know. In, uh, inviting the Westerners, encouraging Shula, not just encouraging, but kind of like pressuring Shula Sridhar Maharaj, like, please give shelter to them. 
you know, like especially after Swami Maharaj Prabhupada left the world and ISKCON was going through its own troubles, right? Then many of those Westerners were, were coming for shelter from Srila Srila Maharaj. And Srila Srila Maharaj was not very inclined to give that shelter, actually. You know, he he was he was concerned. He Srila Srila Maharaj didn't want to make a big mission. He wanted to represent his guru. And if that meant it was small, then it was then it would be small. But Srila Srila Maharaj wanted to maintain very purely, you know, the standard of his guru Maharaj, right? And there are, I mean, we don't have so much time, but there are so many examples of that I can give, you know. And, you know, his, his our mission in Srila Srila Maharaj is, under Srila Srila Maharaj, it was, it was like poor and small. And he was very strict. <laughs> You know, we heard from David Shish, David Shish Prabhu said he's our the secretary of our London mission. He told, mentioned to our Gurudev once, oh, I wish I could have seen Guru Maharaj, Guru Maharaj meaning Srila Srila Maharaj when he was in his early years. And our Gurudev told him you wouldn't have been able to tolerate it. You know, he was very strict. You wouldn't have been able to tolerate it. You know, no one could follow his standard, you know. You know, we heard stories, you know, uh, one of our Western devotees, Shudu Shava, he told us of one American devotee. He was sitting and playing cartels in the kirtan. And Srila Srinamar sent someone down from his room. He wanted to know who's playing the cartels too loudly. Like, that's how strict Srila Srinamar was. He would send, he would send. I also heard from one of our Indian sannyasis, Tirthamar, he would send he would sometimes send someone to do a spot check on what any what, what everyone was doing at the mock. Like just suddenly he's going and doing it, knocking on your door. Oh, Guru Maharaj wants to know what you're doing. Like right now. You know, I heard this from Tirtha Maharaj. And, and he got a knock once from Gora Krishna, who was a secretary of Srila Srila Maharaj. He knocks on Tirtha Maharaj's door. Oh, Guru Maharaj wants to know what you're doing. He's reading a book of Bhakti Vinod Thakur. I mean, come on. He's reading a book of Bhakti you Nautaka. Know, you think like that's going to be a pass. It's not a pass. You know, then the Guru Krishna goes and reports to Srila Srila Maharaj. And he, Guru Yeni comes back. Oh, Guru Maharaj says, you know, why are you sitting in your room reading Bhakti you Nautaka? Know, you should be doing your service in the printing press. <laughs> and then when you're doing that service, you know, then automatically, you know, you'll be you'll be reading the books, right? Our Guru Dave, he wanted to, he wanted to exercise. Srila Srinivas wouldn't let him exercise. He says, oh, go, go do your service in the garden. And when you're, while you're gardening, you'll naturally be exercising, right? So this was Srila Srinivas' standard. Like you, you know, hardly anyone could, could stay there. And it's very interesting because Srila Srinivas, his god brothers, they, they all, Srila Srila Maharaj's godbrothers, they all looked to Srila Srila Maharaj like as a, as a guide. You know, they came to him for guidance and instruction. Um, and they all had, they all had like, like some of Srila Srila Maharaj's godbrothers, they had big, powerful missions. They had like many followers. They had multiple temples across India. But they, but who are they going to for advice? Srila Srila Maharaj had a tiny little poor ma with a few brahmacharis, right? <laughs> it's very interesting. You know, it's very interesting. And, and we've heard Srila Srila Maharaj say, like, you know, there were certain things that some of his godbrothers would do, like for popularity. And, you know, like as an example, um, welcome Ramananda Prabhu, who's joined us. Dandos <laughs> Vishakadiji. Sorry, join a little late. <laughs> no problem. Um, you know, like for example, Srila Srinivas mentioned in one place, I mean, maybe I shouldn't say for example, but I'm not trying to criticize anyone. I'm just saying things as they are, you know. Like there's this Julan Yatra, this swing festival, right? And when they when they swing Radha and Krishna, deities are Radha and Krishna. And and Srila Sridhar said, you know, like my Guru Maharaj would never allow that. You know, how can we think we can swing Radha and Krishna? 
And he said, now my God brothers, they're doing this, you know, because the people like it, it attracts people. But he said, our Guru Maharaj would never allow that. And he said, I am not free. I'm not free to do as I like, but I'm sticking to the to the will of my Guru Maharaj. He was very strict. One time Srila Maharaj kicked out his own God brother from his mod. And he wasn't happy to do that. He was very sad to do it because it was Krishnas Babaji, who's actually a great devotee. But he was mixing with these kirtans. When they, it's called Leela Kirtan. And they'll sing these, these songs, very high pastimes. And they sing in this very stylistic, showy way. And, and going into very elevated topics, which aren't not really, we're not eligible for. And so Krishna's Babaji, he's actually a pure devotee. And so when he goes to those kirtans, he's, you know, he's like getting some higher thing out of it. And, and but Srila Maharaj knew this is not the standard of our Guru Maharaj's mission. We don't go to this type of kirtan. We're representing something. We're setting an example. So Srila Maharaj told his God brother, you know, I'm pleased. You know, I don't mind if you go to these kirtans, but if you're staying in my temple, if you're staying at my ma, please don't go. If you're staying somewhere else, I don't mind. But, you know, I have to stand for my Guru Maharaj. I have to represent. So please, you know, don't do that. Krishna's Babaji doesn't listen to him. He keeps going. And then Srila Maharaj has to tell him, you know, please, you, you have to leave. You know, you have to go. And he was not happy to do that. Our Gurudev, we heard our Gurudev talk about it. And our Gurudev also came to him, well, why are you doing this? Our Gurudev was sad, you know. But Srila Shidmar said, it is, my, it is my duty. You know, I have to stick to the, to my Guru Maharaj standard, you know. And then later, a few days, then Krishna's Babaji went to stay at someone else's temple, another god brother. And then he came back a few days later <laughs> to our temple <laughs> And Srila Srinivar said, said, oh, why, why are you here? I thought I told you to leave. And, and Krishna's Babaji told him, but you didn't say I couldn't come back. <laughs> so they had this kind of intimate relationship. So Srila Srinivar was not out, you know, to be popular. You know, he, he strictly wanted to follow the highest standard. And as he, there's one article where he's saying, um, is very nice actually. Um, let me see if I can find it now. And but he he mentions like like he's talking about this point. He's saying you know I just want to go on with the, you know the the highest standard with a few helping hands. He says it like that. Like if I can have a few persons to help me, you know, then I'll be happy. Uh, what is the name of that topic? I can't remember. I can't remember. But um, but there's one place where he's just kind of ex explicitly talking about this, you know, like almost like shamelessly, you know, like like he's saying, like it's with um he's speaking to Bhakti Sudhir Goswami and and he's saying, you know, like I've been giving you all hints for a little while, you know, that you should all, you know, move on, you know. <laughs> Because actually in the beginning, Srila Maharaj, his vision was that the Westerners would have their own mission. It was called the Maha Mandal. And, and there, was a, there was a piece of land down the road. For, it was like, what, 10 minute walk from our temple. We call, used to call it the land of nectar. I'm sure Chen Waifuru went there a number of times. And, and, um, and so in the beginning, the, there, would be like, there was like this in, big encampment, like what, 50 devotees, maybe up to 100 Westerners who were one time and and they would stay here like some distance and then come to Srila Maharaj and then go back and and this was Srila Maharaj's mission that I vision that they would the westerners would have their own mission and he would be kind of like a consultant like they would have their own initiating gurus they'd have their own separate program and they'd come sometimes to get some guidance from Srila Maharaj. that was his vision but in the end and you know largely because of our Guru Dave's um you know, in, you know, in treaties to Srila Srinamaraj, then, then Srila Srinamaraj began giving more shelter. Our Guru Dev built guest houses on the temple grounds, you know, that was also a little alarming. We heard when, 
Sheila Schiedemar saw the first Western guest house going up. And he was a little alarmed by that, you know? So <laughs> that that's what kind of how things, that was how things developed, but, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't um, Shula Shidemar's original um, vision. We have a uh, Chintamini's asking in the chat about. Oh, the land of nectar. Well, uh, let's talk about that later. I've heard some things, but I won't. Don't want to discuss it right now. <laughs> um. So yeah, I mean, you know, that's I guess that's what I have to say on that subject matter. No. And you know, another thing that Shila Shudamarj mentioned, like he and we know he had this Brahminical nature, you know, and he mentioned himself, like it's difficult for me to mix so freely, you know, with the with the Westerners. He had a he had his, you know, particular nature. Oh, Chin White Prabhu, you found it. Servant of the ideal. Wow. Oh my God, man. Man, you you deserve an award, man. <laughs> yeah, this is it. So Chin, Chin White Prabhu put the link in the chat. I, I would like to kind of read through this um very quickly. Or we can skim through it. By the mercy of the Vaishnavas, I have no ambition. In my life, I have no ambition in the world. This is my special special nature. From the beginning, from my childhood, although one may not believe it, if anyone praises me, I feel some pain in my heart. I told one of my friends at that time that whenever anyone praises me, I feel some sort of uneasiness, but he did not believe it. Really, for Pratishta, for good name, I have no ostentatious hankering. At least this is what I can say if I am to speak plainly. I want the naked truth and I want to submit to that. Internal realization is the main feature within me. I want higher internal realization. And for that, I have eliminated the company of so many of my God brothers that are fond of me and tried to remain alone as much as possible and as small as possible with a few helping hands. This is my nature. Still, because I am in the world, some troubles must come from outside. And by the grace of the Lord, I am to meet them in some way, in my way. Let Guru and Guranga save me so that I may remain strictly under their guidance. I am unfit for any life of splendor and grandeur. From the core of my heart, I do not like grandeur. I prefer simple life. Sometimes complexity approaches me, but I try to eliminate that on the whole from my life. That is my tendency. Complexity comes and I try to eliminate it, to be separate from it. From the beginning, when you came here in Nam, so Shri Shri is speaking to this group of Westerners, right? This is like early 80s. From the beginning, when you came here in numbers, I said that you must maintain a separate concern, keeping connection with me. From the beginning, I had this conception. Sometimes I'm giving hints about it. <laughs> and sometimes I'm clearly saying it. Dear Krishna Maharaj made a remark. Yes, we know that you have much affection for us. When birds are little grown up, their mother pushes them out of the nest so that they can learn to fly with their own wings. The birds are thrown out by their mother so that they may have the chance to fly. This remark was made to me by dear Krishna Prabhu when I told him in the beginning that you must have an independent form, keeping connection with me. This is my nature. I cannot tolerate much splendor or a very grand environment. Simplicity, that of a mendicant Brahmin, easy life, plain life, not struggling for anything else. This is what I prefer. Where as much as I can, I save my time for internal realizations in poetry and also giving them out in poetry, Sanskrit or Bengali. Higher, higher realization is the aim of my life. I speak it plainly to you. I have no physical or expansive engagement. What I have, I can give you and nothing more. Some may think that I am cruel or unjust by always giving hints that you all must go and live separately. <laughs> But this is what I am. It is my nature. I am a peace-loving man who is busy for his own realization. And with whatever I have, I may try to help those and only those who come to me. 
This I can do and nothing more. You may not believe it as you're all coming and seeing here, houses being erected and all these other things. So, and this is by our Guru Dave's arrangement, of course. <laughs> Sometimes I feel very perplexed. When I was in a thatched hut here some 30 years back, I wrote a poem which was published on the cover of Prapanajiva Namrita in 43 or 44 in Kolkata, very near Swami Marsh. And then there's this verse. So this, this part of it, like, so I'm a declared man. <laughs> From the beginning in that poem that was published in 44 or 43, I've written what I am. This is my object. This is my campaign. I am a servant of that ideal. Still now I am there. My Guru Maharaj also posted me there. Wow. I'll just maybe quickly go over this for this. He also mentions this verse. Shri Mak Jaitanya Saraswata Matavada Udgita Kirti Dayata. The flag of Shitajani Sarasamat flutters very high in Gupta Govardhan on the banks of the Ganges and Nadia. The flag on high announces the victory of Shitajani Sarasamat and the mat glitters on the banks of the Ganges and Gupta Govardhan. What is the principle upheld by Shitajani Sarasamat? What is its nature? What do they do there? Their internal aspirations for Radhika and Madhava strictly in the line of Rupanuga. From Garanga to Saraswati, Shri Gurudev, this dire current, the thought that was current from Garanga up to Saraswati, they are engaged fully in that. They are fully engaged in cultivation according to the current that began from Sri Chaitanya and ended in Saraswati, referring to Saraswati Thakur. Goraga Thakur Nanti, their main business is to talk about Sri Garanga, his greatness, his, his nobility and his instructions. What is their aim? Shri Madhupa Nuga Shri Kritamati, what is recommended given out by Rupa Goswami and the Rupa Nugas. Their mind is made up, dedicated according to that principle. And what is their aim in that line regulated by Shri Rupa and his followers? Radhika Madhavasham, Radhika and Madhava, Radha and Krishna. This is announced by Raghunam Das Goswami. <laughs> well um thank you for bringing up that that question julian and um i think we're going to close there for today um Bhaja bala is just tuning in oh Bhaja bala you're just coming now we're at the end of our meeting we we start um one hour before and um yeah well hopefully we can see you next time <laughs> Thank well, you so much, Vishaka Didi. That was amazing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so thank you, Vishaka. Recheck of our ideals. <laughs> it's it's really healthy for us to you know be reminded yeah. of this and you know and we're we're very fortunate to be connected with such a pure and authentic line of Krishna consciousness coming through the hearts of Shri Shri Maharaj and Shri Govinda Maharaj. Okay, I'm going to stop there for today. Um, any any last words from Chinmoy Prabhu or anyone else in our group here today? Jai. Jai. And thank you so much, Chinmoy Prabhu, for, for finding that. <laughs> I've, never, I've never read that before. It's really amazing to see him explaining himself clearly. Isn't it amazing, that talk? I remember when I first read that, it was like, wow it's like wow yeah it's it's so clear yeah. so clear it's so frank so frank it's incredible yeah jai shla bhakti sundar govinda dev goswami marj ki jai shla bhakti rakshak shidhar dev goswami marj ki jai shri tishanya sarasat mat ki jai all the assembled devotees and sincere seekers ki jai Hari Nam Sankir Chanki Jai. Jai. Hari Bol. Jai. 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 See you all next time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.